What if I told you that General Motors, the most powerful automaker on earth, nearly destroyed itself with a four-cylinder engine the size of a microwave? Not through some catastrophic explosion or racing disaster, but through something far worse. Millions of angry customers, class action lawsuits, and a reputation hit so devastating it took decades to recover. This is the story of the Vega 2300, the engine that was supposed to revolutionize American small cars, and instead became the most hated power plant in GM history. Picture this. It's 1968, and you're sitting in the 14th floor conference room at GM headquarters in Detroit. Through the floor-to-ceiling windows, you can see the company's vast technical center sprawling across 330 acres in Warren, Michigan. The men around the polished mahogany table, and they were all men, control an empire that builds one out of every two cars sold in America. They've just made a decision that will cost the company billions, destroy customer loyalty for a generation, and teach the entire auto industry a brutal lesson about what happens when bean counters overrule engineers. The Chevrolet Vega and its 2300 engine weren't just another car project. They represented GM's answer to a threat the company had ignored for too long. The invasion of small, efficient imports from Japan and Germany that were starting to eat into the Big Three's market share. By 1970, imports had captured 15% of the U.S. market, up from just 5% a decade earlier. GM needed to prove it could build a small car as good as anything from Toyota or Volkswagen. They failed spectacularly. But here's where it gets interesting. The tragedy of the Vega 2300 wasn't that GM's engineers didn't know how to build a good engine. They absolutely did. The tragedy was that management repeatedly overruled engineering decisions to save pennies per unit, creating a cascade of failures that would ultimately cost billions. This is a story about what happens when quarterly profit reports matter more than long-term quality when marketing promises outrun engineering reality, and when a company becomes so arrogant it ignores its own experts. To understand why the Vega project went so catastrophically wrong, we need to travel back to 1967. Ed Cole, GM's president and a genuine car guy who'd helped develop the small block Chevy V8 was worried. He saw the sales numbers for the VW Beetle, over 400,000 units in America that year, he saw the Toyota Corolla gaining ground. He knew GM needed a competitive small car, and he wanted it to be revolutionary. Cole handed the project to John DeLorean, the young, ambitious general manager of Chevrolet. Yes, that DeLorean, the one who would later create the stainless steel sports car with gold wing doors. In 1968, he was GM's golden boy, a genuine engineering talent who understood both the technical and marketing sides of the business. DeLorean wanted to build a world-class small car. What he got was a master class in corporate interference. The initial engineering targets for the Vega were ambitious but achievable. The car would weigh no more than 2,000 pounds. It would deliver 30 miles per gallon. It would cost no more than $1,800, about $14,000 in today's money. And most importantly, it would be reliable enough to compete with the Japanese. To power this revolutionary small car, GM would develop an all-new four-cylinder engine using cutting-edge technology. The engine that emerged from GM's engineering department was genuinely innovative, designated RPO L11, but known universally as the 2300 for its displacement in cubic centimeters. It featured an aluminum block with cast iron cylinder sleeves, not unusual today but advanced for 1970. The overhead cam design was modern and efficient. Initial prototypes showed promise, then the cost cutting began. Here's the thing about aluminum engine blocks. They expand and contract at different rates than iron components when heated and cooled. This means you need very precise tolerances and high quality gaskets to maintain proper sealing. You also need excellent cooling system design to manage heat distribution. GM's engineers knew this. They specified copper core radiators, multi-layer steel head gaskets, and precision machine surfaces. Management looked at the cost and said no. Let me put that in perspective. The copper core radiator the engineers wanted cost GM about $12 more per unit 
than the aluminum radiator that was ultimately used. $12. On a car with a base price of $2,090. That decision alone would lead to overheating problems that destroyed thousands of engines. The production Vega 2300 engine displaced 140 cubic inches, or 2.3 liters. It used a single overhead cam operating eight valves through rocker arms. The aluminum block was die cast using a process GM called Accurad, which was supposed to eliminate porosity problems common in aluminum castings. The cast iron cylinder sleeves were held in place by the differential thermal expansion between iron and aluminum. When the engine got hot, the aluminum expanded more than the iron, theoretically gripping the sleeves tighter. In theory, it was brilliant. In practice, it was a nightmare. The compression ratio was 8.5.1, conservative, even for 1970. The single-barrel Rochester Monojet carburetor was sized for economy, not performance. Output was 90 horsepower at 4,800 RPM and 136 pound-feet of torque at 2,400 RPM. For comparison, the contemporary Toyota Corolla's 1.6-liter engine made 73 horsepower. The Vega should have been competitive, but those numbers only mattered if the engine stayed together long enough to use them. The problem started immediately. The first Vegas rolled off the assembly line at Lordstown, Ohio in September 1970. By October, warranty claims were flooding in, engines were overheating, head gaskets were failing, oil consumption was astronomical. Some owners reported adding a quart of oil every 300 miles. The aluminum radiators couldn't dissipate heat fast enough. The engine would overheat. The aluminum head would warp. The head gasket would fail, and coolant would mix with oil, destroying the engine from the inside out. But wait, there's more. Remember those cast iron cylinder sleeves held in place by thermal expansion when the engine overheated, which it did constantly? The aluminum would expand too much. The sleeves would actually become loose in their bores. They could shift, rotate, or in extreme cases, drop into the crankcase. When that happened, the engine didn't just fail. It grenaded. GM's response to these problems revealed everything wrong with American corporate culture in the 1970s. Instead of admitting the fundamental design flaws and fixing them, they blamed customers. Oil consumption, you're not maintaining it properly. Overheating, you must be driving it too hard. Engine failure at 30,000 miles should have changed the oil more frequently. Internal GM documents later revealed in lawsuits showed engineers had identified these problems during development. A memo from April 1969, 16 months before production started, warned that the aluminum radiator was inadequate for sustained highway driving in ambient temperatures above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Another report from January 1970 detailed concerns about head gasket durability. Management's response, ship it anyway. We'll fix it in production if we have to. The Lordstown plant itself became part of the problem. GM had invested $75 million to create the most automated assembly plant in the world, capable of producing 100 cars per hour, one every 36 seconds. The workforce, averaging just 24 years old, was the youngest in GM's system. Labor relations were terrible. Quality suffered. Some workers, frustrated by the pace and repetitive nature of the work, would deliberately sabotage cars, leaving bolts loose, scratching paint, even reportedly dropping washers into the engine to create mysterious rattles. Now here's the kicker. While all this was happening, GM's marketing department was running ads calling the Vega the little car that does everything well. They bragged about its advanced engineering, its durability, its value. Motor Trend magazine, in what remains one of the most embarrassing moments in automotive journalism, named the Vega its 1971 Car of the Year. Within two years, that same magazine would run articles about how to keep your Vega running past 40,000 miles. The 1972 model year brought the first round of fixes. GM added an overflow bottle to the cooling system. A $3 part that should have been there from the start. They revised the head gasket design. They modified the PCV valve to reduce oil consumption. None of it was enough. Engines were still failing at alarming rates. For 1973, more changes. The cylinder sleeves were redesigned with a different iron alloy that was supposed to maintain better dimensional stability. The pistons received longer, 
skirts to reduce scuffing, the oil pan capacity was increased by half a quart. Their solution to oil consumption was to give you more oil to burn. These changes helped, but the fundamental problems remained. Then came the silicon scream. That's what mechanics called the death rattle of a Vega 2300 with worn cylinder bores. As the crosshatch honing pattern wore away, the pistons would slap against the cylinder walls, creating a distinctive knocking sound that got progressively worse until the engine seized. Some owners reported the noise starting as early as 20,000 miles. The cost cutting extended beyond just the engine. The Vega's front fenders were designed with inadequate rust protection and poor drainage, and they would rust through in as little as two years in the salt belt states. The interior plastics were so cheap they would crack and fade within months. The optional two-speed power glide automatic transmission, yes, two speeds in 1970, was so inadequate it would overheat under normal driving conditions. But GM doubled down. For 1974, they increased the displacement to 122 cubic inches, or 2.0 liters, by reducing the bore and lengthening the stroke. This was supposed to improve durability by reducing piston speed. They also finally upgraded to a two-barrel carburetor on some models. The compression ratio dropped to 8.1 to meet emissions requirements. Power stayed about the same, but fuel economy actually got worse. The numbers speak for themselves. By 1974, the Vega had the highest warranty claim rate in GM history. Consumer reports rated it not acceptable, their lowest possible rating. Resale values plummeted. A three-year-old Vega was worth less than 30% of its original price compared to over 50% for a Toyota Corolla. Inside GM, the finger-pointing was vicious. DeLorean, who had fought against many of the cost-cutting measures, left Chevrolet in 1973, later writing in his autobiography that the Vega was the worst product GM ever built. Engineers who had warned about the problems were told they were being negative and not team players. Several were transferred to other divisions or encouraged to take early retirement. The tragedy is that GM knew how to fix most of these problems. In 1975, they introduced the Cosworth Vega, a limited production model with a proper twin cam 16 valve head designed by Cosworth Engineering in England. It had forged pistons, a larger radiator, electronic fuel injection, and proper engineering throughout. It was reliable, powerful, and expensive. $6,000 nearly doubled the base Vega's price. GM built just 3,508 of them, proving they could build a good engine when they wanted to. For 1976, GM finally bit the bullet and introduced what they called the Dura Built 2300. This featured hydraulic valve lifters instead of mechanical ones, reducing valve train noise. They added a stronger head gasket, improved coolant passages, and redesigned pistons. They even changed the cylinder bore. Finishing process using a softer hone that retained oil better. It was the engine they should have built from the start. Think about that for a second. It took GM six years and hundreds of thousands of warranty claims to implement. Fixes their own engineers had recommended before production started. The lawsuits were already flying. A class action suit filed in 1977 alleged that GM knew about the engine's defects and sold the car anyway. The case was settled out of court for an undisclosed sum, but industry insiders estimated it cost GM over $100 million. The final insult came with the 1977 model year. GM was so desperate to salvage something from the Vega program that they actually dropped their own 2300 engine and started offering a Pontiac-built cast-iron four-cylinder called the Iron Duke. Yes, they replaced their advanced aluminum engine with a traditional iron block design that was heavier, less powerful, but infinitely more reliable. The admission of failure was complete. Production ended on August 4, 1977. In seven years, GM built 2,110,147 in Vegas. Industry analysts estimated that warranty claims, lawsuits, and lost customer loyalty cost GM over $2 billion, nearly $10 billion in today's money. But the real cost was harder to measure. How many customers bought their first Toyota or Honda because their Vega left them stranded? How many never came back to GM? Here's something that still amazes engineers today. 
The basic architecture of the Vega 2300 wasn't fundamentally flawed. With proper materials, adequate cooling, and correct tolerances, could have been a decent engine. Proof came from an unexpected source, circle track racers. In the 1980s, long after production ended, racing teams discovered that with aftermarket parts addressing the original problems, copperhead gaskets, better radiators, proper clearances, the 2300 could be built into a reliable racing engine. Some are still running today in vintage racing series. The Vega disaster changed GM forever. It led to massive reforms in quality control, the establishment of more rigorous testing protocols, and eventually the Saturn project. GM's attempt to prove they could build small cars as good as the Japanese, it also accelerated the career of a young executive named Roger Smith who promised the board he could fix GM's quality problems through automation and efficiency. His solutions would create their own disasters. But that's another story. The engineering lessons were clear and brutal. You cannot cut corners on cooling systems and aluminum engines. You cannot ignore thermal expansion difference between dissimilar metals. You cannot expect customers to tolerate catastrophic failures at 30,000 miles. But there's a deeper lesson here about corporate culture and the danger of prioritizing short-term profits over long-term reputation. Every dollar GM saved by cheapening the Vega cost them hundreds in warranty claims and thousands in lost future sales. They knew the math, but quarterly earnings reports don't capture customer rage or generational brand damage. Today, aluminum engines are everywhere. Your Honda Civic has one, your Ford F-150 probably has one. They're reliable, efficient, and durable because manufacturers learn from GM's mistakes. Modern engines use better alloys, improved casting techniques, proper gasket materials, and adequate cooling systems. The technology wasn't wrong. The execution was criminal. The Vega 23 here engine stands as a monument to what happens when corporate arrogance meets engineering reality. It's a reminder that in the automotive world, you can't fake quality. You can't marketing speak your way out of a blown head gasket. You can't cost cut your way to reliability. Physics doesn't care about your profit margins. In the end, the Vega 2300 did revolutionize the American auto industry, just not the way GM intended. It taught Detroit that the era of planned obsolescence was over. It proved that American consumers would abandon domestic brands for Japanese reliability. It demonstrated that in the modern automotive market, your reputation is only as good as your worst engine. The final production Vega rolled off the line with no fanfare, no ceremony, no acknowledgement from GM management. Today, pristine Vegas are actually becoming collectible, partly because so few survive, partly because they represent such a spectacular failure from the world's largest automaker. They're rolling reminders of what happens when you put spreadsheets ahead of engineering, when you value quarterly profits over customer trust, when you believe your own marketing instead of your own engineers. The Vega 2300 wasn't just an engine failure. It was a betrayal of trust on an industrial scale a self-inflicted wound that took General Motors decades to heal. It proved that in the brutal democracy of the marketplace, even the mightiest corporation can be brought low by something as simple as a bad head gasket and an inadequate radiator. So the next time you see a modern car roll past 200,000 miles without major engine work, remember the Vega. Remember the customers who watch their engines destroy themselves at 30,000 miles. Remember the engineers whose warnings were ignored. Remember that every reliable aluminum engine on the road today exists because GM showed the entire industry exactly what not to do. What's the worst automotive disaster you've witnessed? Drop a comment below and share your story. And if you want more tales of engineering triumphs and catastrophes, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Until next time, keep those engines running and properly cooled.